Okay, so good evening. Um, welcome to Real-Time Analytics on Cognitive Services in Azure. And I'm Alicia Moniz. I'm very excited to be here with you all tonight. And thank you for having me. Thanks a lot, Alicia, for your time. I know it's an early morning at your end. <laughs> uh, that's on Sunday. So thanks a lot for uh, for your time and you know for this uh, accepting this invite for the webinar for uh, the community. Oh, thank you for having me. I'm always excited to to speak on on AI and AI topics. Great. Let me just get settled here. Okay, so a little bit about me. My name is Alicia Moniz, and um, my background is heavy in data warehousing and analytics. Um, I've been working in the Microsoft BI stack since um, SQL Server 2005, and with the evolution of, of data and what the art of possible with data. Um, naturally, I've I've landed in the AI space. Um, I'm a consultant with the Avanade practice. I'm lead of their analytics video practice here in Houston, and um, I like to travel to different past community events to speak on Microsoft topics. So I I blog occasionally, but um, between work and everything else, I, I probably don't blog as often as I should. And um, I'm also certified in both Azure and AWS in both big data and architecture. So um, I'm an architecture expert in the Azure stack and I get to build solutions in Azure for our clients. So a little bit about what I had planned for us today. Um, what I'd really like to talk about is the Lambda architecture in Azure and different ways that we can interact with the Cognitive Services APIs, as well as um, different tools that are available to us. So um, usually people who are sitting in on the cognitive services courses, um, they're a little heavier on the data side. And, you know, that's where a lot of us start is, you know, we've been using SQL for a while, um, maybe a little bit of Python, maybe a little bit of R. And it's talking about how do we bring that ecosystem together so that we can fully leverage the, the tools that are available to us in, within Azure. And I think Microsoft does a really great job as far as looking at the ecosystem and looking at um, what does your day look like and how do we streamline the process, you know, and looking at a, a software development perspective. Um, people have been developing software and people have been um, administering data for quite a while. And now that we have these new problems and these new challenges, we have new tools, but we can definitely leverage the, the learnings that we already have with, with keeping data consistent, you know, with adding data or projects to a, a data repository. And um, so I'll go ahead and touch on a couple of the tools that Microsoft has made available to us. To, to make this process a, a lot easier. Um, so we'll talk a little bit about Lambda architecture. Um, I'll introduce you to cognitive services. I'll do a demo where we'll build out a custom vision model. I'll introduce you to Azure Notebooks if you haven't already played around with that. And we'll go ahead and interact with one of the new cognitive services APIs, the FACE API. So let's get started with the Lambda architecture. So most of us are familiar with the, the traditional um, data warehouse 
ODS data store um, methodology with respect to, to aggregating data into a centralized location. So when we look at Lambda and we looked at look at Azure and we look at, you know, what is the difference in what we're trying to do and what different tools do we need to do those? Um, you can see that in, within the Lambda architecture, you have a batch and a serving layer that is very similar to traditional on-prem reporting systems. So you're going to go ahead and ingest new data into a master data set, and then you'll have views built on top of that. So between the batch layer and the serving layer, many of us are, are very aware and comfortable of, of what those mean and what tools are available to us. So traditionally, this is going to be some type of, of enterprise database system, and we'll have some views built on top of that, some stored procedures to, to aggregate data, and that turns into the serving layer. Now, what's new is the speed layer. And what's different in what we're trying to do in the use case is the, the, sh the sheer quantity and volume of the data that we're trying to, to process and ingest. So when we look at the frequency of processing data in the traditional means, um, usually this is like an hourly batch process or a daily batch process. But what the speed layer does is we want to go ahead and process data and pass data more real time. And the emphasis is going to be, be more of a, a snapshot basis than on an accuracy basis. So we want to go ahead and pass that data so that it's available for real-time analysis. But we also want to pass it down back to the master data set so that we can assure that in the long run, what we're doing is going to sync up and we'll have the benefits of being able to, to clean that data. So as, as you can imagine, in the speed layer, we, we do have to worry about things like like bias and bad data sets. And we do have to kind of think about accommodating for, for data flutes that get passed through. So some of the tools that we have for, for building out the, um, the Lambda architecture are going to be Databricks and the Azure Event Hubs. So Databricks is an Azure flavor of Apache Spark, and it's open source, distributed general purpose cluster computing. And the event hubs are going to be um, a message processing interface that will allow us to, to pass events. So what we see here is we have for Azure Event Hubs, we have event producers. And they'll go ahead and pass data to different scalable partitions. And basically what this is, is this is the Azure flavor of, of Kafka, Apache Kafka, Kafka. So what Microsoft has done is they have abstracted away a lot of the processes so that the it will go ahead and scale out um, without you having to manage anything under the hood. So you can go ahead and ingest, buffer, store, and process data in real time. And you can set up your receivers to either process data on demand or process data in, in a streaming methodology. And the message queue will allow you to be event-based with your processing. Um, so when you're configuring this, you can not only process with one group of people, but you can process with many groups of people. So say 
when we're looking back at our architecture, we want to go ahead and pass this data to our operational data store so that we can update our history. But we also want to pa pass this data to like an email queue or to an actual person to process an activity. Then you can set up multiple consumer groups with multiple roles and they can go through and they can process data according to the rules that you've provided. And it's a scalable service and it dynamically scales. And that's one of the benefits of, of using the process on Azure. So this is an example Lambda architecture that integrates not only the event hubs, but the Azure Databricks. So what we're looking at here is this is this is a bit of the new, right? So we're looking at how do we how do we handle this this new type of unstructured streaming data? So um, down here we have a bit of data that we're we're used to streaming or processing already. So log data, media data, files, um, structured custom app data. What Azure Event Hubs lets us do is it lets us go ahead and, and dynamically pass that data in. And then we can go ahead and either store it directly into blob storage for later processing. And this stream down here is, is more of our code path. Um, we can go ahead and add that data when we're, we're able to, to clean and process to our operational data store and fold that into historical transactional and, and trend line reporting and expose that for Power BI reporting or, or some other fa fashion of reporting. On the flip side of that, we can also pass that data a service like Azure Databricks um, or, or to a process where we can go ahead and run Python on, and our data on that. And we can dynamically serve that to um, like a Cosmos DB system or some type of app where there's more real-time processing of the data. You can see that we can go ahead and add in not only the new data, but we can go also add in our batch data down here. So this is Azure Data Factory, pulling in data from our traditional data sources, adding it into Blob, and merging it with data that we're also co collecting dynamically via our, our event hubs. So. I'd like to introduce you to Cognitive Services. And what we'll do is we'll go ahead and once we're familiar with the APIs, we'll set an API up and then we'll start integrating with it and playing around with the code for that. So I like to start off with the AI demos web page. So for those of you who have never experienced the Cognitive Services APIs, this is a really good way to, to gently introduce yourself. And I also reference this page to um, many of my non-technical people that I work with. And I, I think, there's a lot of questions as far as, you know, what is AI and what can AI do for me and what can AI do for my customers and, or, my, or my business? And um, I think part of it is is not so much understanding how it works in the, the covers, but understanding the, the use cases for what these services are able to do for us. So the AI demos page is a, it's a portal to the Cognitive Services APIs. Um, the most commonly and frequently used 
are going to be language, text, and vision. We can go ahead and go into the text analytics section. And I'm just going to add in here my family lives in Hawaii. And I'm from Hawaii. And my family absolutely loves it there. We try to go back as often as we can. But um, being in Houston, I've, I've moved a little farther away. So of course, one of the features of the text API is the ability to provide a sentiment analysis. So right off the bat, we have, this is 84% that this sentiment is positive. This, the scale is going to sway from a 0 to 1. Now it's also extracted the, the entity Hawaii. So what you'll notice is it's actually identified a location for you to find out more information about Hawaii. And we can actually click on that. So basically what they did was uh, for, for testing and producing this API, they, they use Wikipedia as a, as a sample data set. So when you're using the API, you'll notice that your, your accuracy is going to be a lot higher if you use words, terms, and phrases that are identical to what's being used on the Wikipedia site. And that's why, because it was used as part of the sample set. So it's, it's kind of interesting there. And it also drives a lot of the Bing search functionality, um, which is a new class of API that's now available. So we're fairly familiar with text analytics. Um, I like to spend a lot of time on the computer vision analytics. So we have four set, subsets of functionality that the computer vision will, will let us do. So we'll start out with analyze and describe objects. And some of the tags down here are water, outdoor, skyscraper, sky, lake, reflection day. So it's, it's interesting to see that as we make advances in the text analytics, because now we have a phrase piecing those tags together, that that folds into the capabilities of the vision analytics. So I, I think that's, that's interesting right off the bat because you know as progress is made against the text analytics API, that will also affect the result of your vision API capabilities. Another interesting thing to note is um, We've also got some adult classifications here and racy content classifications here. So right off the bat, it really tells you about um, the importance that Microsoft is placing on, on ethics and the use of AI in the marketplace. So definitely see more of that to come and well integrated into the different API functionalities. So stepping through this, we can also go ahead and read text and imagery. So we have two number 42s here, and it's been able to successfully pull both of those out. Handwriting and imagery. Which is pretty neat, and you can understand the implications for 
um, transcription related tasks and functionality that you can add to your applications. And celebrities and landmarks. And this is fairly interesting. And knowing that this is supervised learning, um, of course, you're going to have to have a, a pretty ample data set to provide results with this level of confidence. So the API would have had to have had a, a finite number of images for a certain person, place, or thing in order to come up with a confidence level that high. So again, this is AI demos at Microsoft.com. And it's going to be your portal to many of the cognitive services APIs. And I hand this out to people and um, they have an opportunity to, to play around with it and, and get a little more comfortable with the services. Okay, so let's talk a little bit more about cognitive services vision and what the difference is between computer vision and custom vision. So um, computer vision, as we had stepped through, will let you do the image classification, uh, OCR, handwriting recognition, uh, celebrity and landmark changes. Um, and again, these are supervised learning events where Microsoft has gone ahead and they've already collected their sample data set, they've built the model, they've already performed the training. So there's really not much more for you to do. Um, basically, you're uploading an image and passing it to the data model and you're turned back the result set. So what happens when um, you want to train off of a different set of images and you want more control over the output? Um, that's when you put together a custom vision model. So with the custom vision model, you can build your own classifier. You can go ahead and upload your own images, build the model, you'll train it, and then you can go ahead and perform your evaluation activities. The custom vision model also lets you perform object detection. So we can go ahead and upload an image and based on a subset of images that we've previously uploaded and classified, we can determine with a certain level of confidence um, whether or not those items are embedded within the image. And these are bounding boxes. The API will also return back the coordinates relative to the top left of the image um, of the item within the image. So we have potentially one, two, three, four, five, six, potentially six balls within this image. And we'll get an array, a JSON array back with coordinates for those six images, as well as the percentage that, that of confidence that we have with respect to our prediction. Okay, so let's talk about AI for good. So I had mentioned before that um, I recently moved to Houston and one of the things that happened here was Hurricane Harvey. And Hurricane Harvey dumped so much data, so much, um, sorry, not data, so much rain on the area over such a short period of time that 
you know, it, it devastated many areas. Um, so when we look at, you know, how can we be more reactive and how can we, we be more responsive to, to different events? Um, one of the things that we can do is we can leverage AI resources to more speedily process um, video data. I have another time lapse video and this isn't as dramatic as as what we saw previously, but um, we can extract from this video still shots of the waterway filling up as the rain pours down on this area. And if we extrapolate from there and I are able to identify um, these waterways where, you know, hey, it's, it's going to be a big problem if these three main waterways fill up. And we know that, you know, a direct result of this is this intersection will get flooded and we will have to close down this highway, then we'll be better able to more quickly respond to these events and, and possibly prevent them or or at least get the resources in place to to respond to them a lot quicker. So what I'd like to do today is we'll go ahead and build a custom vision model for for flood detection. Using images that we've taken out of this video. So to get started on building a custom vision model, you do need an Azure account. We'll get started at, this is the customvision.ai URL. This is the interface. We'll just step out. I'm already logged in, but let me step out and show you. The entryway. You can access the cognitive services or the custom vision projects here. And it's just a UI to, to play around with your projects. So I'm already signed in here. And we'll go ahead and create a new project. And I have a resource group here that I've already configured against my subscription. Um, we can do two project types here. And um, right now we're just doing a binary classification for um, flood or no flood indicator. Uh, you do have the option of running an object detection project. And that would be if, um, we were looking for items within an image and multiple instances of that item. So that was that image we had seen pre previously with the six balls and one image that would be object detection. But right now we're just going to do a classification and the classification is going to be flood or no flood. I'm gonna go ahead and use a single tag per image. Uh, my domains are going to be in general. So what a domain is going to be is, it's what subset of data would you like to drive your data model? So we see general food landmarks and retail. So 
we had gone over a little bit of the functionality previously, and say specifically for landmarks. We know that that's supervised learning against a very specific set of, of training images. So you can see that as we start utilizing the service and as we start integrating with open source data sources, um, these domains have the potential to explode from four here to, to tens, maybe hundreds in a very short period of time as we start cultivating these data sets and, and sharing data for analytics amongst each other. So right now, I'm just going to go ahead and stay with general. And we'll go ahead and create that project. Now I'm going to go ahead and add in my, my data set. So I have here stills taken from the video where the water is pretty much already spilling over the waterway. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and upload those and tag them as blood. Now I also have a subset of images where the waterway isn't flooded. And I'll go ahead and upload those. As okay, they're not they're not flooded. We'll go ahead and train the model. We'll do a quick test. We can browse our files. And we'll take this one. And for our prediction here, we see that there is an 87.4% probability that the waterway is flooded. Now, when we look at the accuracy of our model, you'll notice that we're at 75%. And this says a lot as far as the importance of the, the data set that you use to train your model. So I can go into I'm going to go back into my images. And there is actually a misclassified image here. If we take a look at this image right here, this was included in the OK folder. As you can see, the waterway is pretty much flooded. And this is what's causing that confusion. It's really important that when we're building these models, that we, we go back and forth and do not only that initial data cleaning, but also that, that human check 
on the results for the data sets. But what's pretty interesting here is that if you think about the, the amount of coding that we would have done um, as, as programmers to come to the conclusion that this model has come to, um, like I basically dragged and dropped 40 images into the UI and within minutes was able to come up with a classifier for floods or no floods. And this is what we're able to do with the cognitive services is AI really lets us train by, by example versus training by code. And these are the, the efficiencies that we can get out of the AI services. And just the time savings is just phenomenal, right? So going into our model, we've trained it. We can go into the settings and we can think about, well, how do we, now that we have this model, sitting out in Azure and it's able to successfully um, predict activities. And this is something where we'd be able to go ahead and use event hubs and stream these images so that we can perform additional an analysis on. Um, it's, it's more of a rate of change type of a question at that point. It's, um, there's just so much data that we can, can pull out of a time series analysis. So as we're streaming the images, not only do we get the images, but we get the timestamps. So we can go ahead and create additional classifications. Um, so we did like a binary slide and okay, but maybe we can add a couple more buckets there. And then after that, we can go ahead and track the rate of change between buckets. So maybe we start with an empty and then a half full classification and then a three quarters full and then a flooded classification. And then we can start tracking the times between those changes in the events. And all of a sudden we can start doing prediction as far as if and when something is going to fall, going to flood. So how we interact with this API is we have our access and authentication key and we have an endpoint. So this model is sitting on the cloud for us. Um, it's running on Microsoft's resources. We don't have to manage anything under the hood. Uh, the model is already built and now we're training it and we're interacting with it. So programmatically, we can go to the cognitive services vision API. We can go to the API documentation. Sorry, they changed this page around a little bit. Okay. We can reference the API. And we can see the expected parameters and the expected outcome from the API. So let me find an easy one. So create image re regions is going to um, 
I die is the one I want. Let me get do a get. There you go. Get widget, get tag. Okay. Let me. Sorry, that isn't a very good example. But basically what the API documentation will show you is Let's do the 2.0. Okay. Is it will tell you the expected parameters? And it will also ex tell you the methods for interacting with the API. Um, so right now, most of my interactions are in Python. Um, what you'll do is you'll start with a request header, um, much like a web page header. You'll go ahead and embed your request parameters. And then you'll reference your API string and you'll parse your response. So when we're looking at the API, we can go back up here and start talking about parameters. And another thing to note is the regions. Um, cognitive services isn't available in every region. Um, what they'll do is they will roll it out. So usually if you're doing testing with cognitive services, you wanna go ahead and stick to um, probably like the most common, the West or the East US just to make sure that the newest APIs are available for you when you're doing your experimentation. So you'll go ahead and reference your API endpoint and pass in your parameters for processing. So when we're looking at our, our options, we had notice adult, so predictability as far as what what adult level. Um, you can pull out, pull out categories, color, description, image type, objects, tags. So when we had been on the AI demos page, and we had gone to custom computer vision. For analyze and describe. We had returned back most of the options for the API, but it's not required to return all that data back every time you're processing your images. So right now the API supports multiple languages, one, two, three, four, five. Um, it's it's kind of interesting that like how much regional bias there is with things like image, text, and language. So you'll notice that not all the languages will always be supported because it it takes a a regional data set to to provide that level of accuracy on the images. So our re request type is going to be, um, how are we passing our image to the API? It gives you um, some response formats. And this is an example of the payload we would receive back from the API broken out in JSON. So 
categories, name, the people name. So this was the image for Satya. We have bounding box for his face within the image, a confidence level. For landmarks, we have a name and a confidence level. And then for adult content, we have the flags, is adult content or is racy content. And tags here that he's a person, man, outdoors. There's a window somewhere in the image. And a text string describing what's in the image for the confidence level. And 48 probably isn't that great. And again, if we scroll down, we see that we can interact with this not only with Python, but you can actually use all the programming languages down here. So it's a, a very handy reference for um, getting to know and getting to utilize any of the cognitive services APIs. Okay, so that was pulling your gets. Um, there's also an API documentation for um, conducting your training. So not only can you pull result sets out of the API programmatically, but you can also train your API programmatically. So um, as you get larger data sets, um, you'll be able to per perform those iterations a lot more quickly. OK, so we've gone ahead and built a custom vision model. And we've talked about um, performing that analytics um, more real time, leveraging the, the AI services. So I'd like to spend a little bit of time on Azure Notebooks. Um, if you haven't already been exposed to Azure Notebooks, um, Azure Notebooks is the, the Azure flavor of Jupyter Notebooks. And I use this a lot, not only for my own work, but I also use it for um, trainings and for when I'm building code that is something that's going to be sustainable and that I can go ahead and hand off to other people on my team. So the URL is going to be notebooks.azure.com. Um, you can also access notebooks in Data Studio. So that's pretty neat. Um, one of the benefits of notebooks is, so I went ahead and logged in. I'm in my project and I have a number of projects in here. I think I'm going to open an existing project. And there's no fee for working in Azure Notebooks. Um, this is running on free compute. Uh, right now, this project is uh, it's a Python project. So I've got my, my Python code in here. This is my notebook. I have also got um, some of my resources are uploaded here. So I have a couple of, of images. Now I've opened up my project. And as you can see, this is a, a full notebook file. Um, one of the benefits of, of working with Azure Notebooks is that I don't have to worry about um, downloading or installing or keeping any of my 
my import files in sync with anybody else on my team. So right now I'm running on Python 3.6. And usually uh, one of the first things that I have to do when I, I work with the data science team is I need to verify that we're all using the same Python version. And then I need to usually install additional libraries to, to keep in sync with them. Um, with Jupyter Notebooks, I can easily share my notebook with other people and they're able to run it within this interface without having to upgrade anything on their system. So it also has the ability to, to do markdown text and integrate that with code. So I'm able to, this is actually an image in here and I'm able to go back and forth between the code and the images and the markdown text where I can go ahead and add as, as much information about my code as I'd like. And then I can go ahead and hand this off to the next person. So looking a little bit at my project um, and We'll go ahead and play around just a little bit with the face API. I'm going to go ahead and reopen my project and I'm going to show you some of my pictures. And I have a couple of pictures of, of some of my speaking events that I've been on throughout the year. And this is a, a group of us. And you can see there's maybe three, six, nine. There's 10 of us. And there's two ladies and eight men. So one of the applications of the face API is, is labeling um, in crowds. So when you're talking about um, crowd responsiveness and crowd participation, uh, you can go ahead and not only pull out emotion, and most of us have, have seen the happy, sad application that, that micro, Microsoft has, but you can also pull out um, your distribution as far as you know how many of your participants are male and how many of your participants are female. And then from there, you can go ahead and do, well, how many of those males are happy and how many of those males are sad as they go through um, participating in your event. So we'll just take a quick look at the base API documentation. And this is one of the newer APIs that they've rolled out with this year. And what it's going to let us do is, so we have bounding boxes here. We can go ahead and pick out emotion. And it will give us the scale from zero to one. So emotions we have are anger, contempt, disgust, fear, happiness, neutral, sadness, and surprise. And we'll go through the documentation, reference, base API. So what I'd like to do is identification. And we're on version 1.0. So that's interesting because you, you know they're going to iterate through a flurry of enhancements over a very short period of time. And actually, let's skip over it into text. 
So we can pull up to 100 faces. Um, it gives you the minimum pixels. And I'm just going to scroll down. So these are all the, the parameters. And most of these are going to be optional because it's, it's kind of a plethora of, of data that they can return back. And it's interesting to note that for this API, they do not store any of the images. They'll go ahead and perform uh, the prediction and return the results back, but they, there is no storage of your images um, on the compute that's running the the API. So that's really interesting. I'm going to scroll down and we'll go ahead and look at some of the payloads. Um, so you're going to go ahead and get your bounding boxes. What we're probably most interested in are the attributes. So we have age, gender, smile, intensity. So that's that. How is our crowd responding to to what we're seeing? Uh, facial hair, which is which is again pretty interesting. So zero to one is how much facial hair based on length the individual has. Um, head pose is going to be more um, coordinate based. Glasses, no glasses. Emotion. We saw the JSON for the emotion. Hair and makeup accessories. And then we've got some we've got some flags here that help us to determine just just how how much faith we should put into the results based on noise. So that's blur ex exposure and general noise classification. So we can go ahead and Look at some of these results pulled back from the JSON. And there's there's quite a bit of landmarks here that they're able to successfully pull out of the image. So my recommendation would be if you have um, a minimal amount of, of people in your file, then would, I would feel much more comfortable in the accuracy of these results. Um, I'm not sure if you had an image with 100 people that you'd be able to, to get these with a very high level of accuracy. So face attributes here, we can go ahead and pick out age, estimated age, gender, smile, and facial hair. And they have that broken out by a mustache, beard, and sideburns. We have the emotions, hair, and makeup. And the API will, again, give you the many ways that you can interact with the API with sample code. We're using Python. So many of the parameters are, are going to be optional. And some of the result sets are, are JSON strings. So we see that here. Uh, what we're going to do is we're going to go ahead and pass our parameters against the API and go ahead and process the content. If I go back into my Jupyter Notebook, We've got our description here of the expected result. I'm looking specifically probably at face attributes. So this Python code will go ahead and call the base libraries. This is my content header type. Um, all I'm really doing is I'm passing the subscription key 
for my cognitive services model. And because this is an, a pre-built model where I'm, I'm not, this isn't custom vision where I'm uploading my own images and I'm, I'm performing my own training and I'm optimizing results. This is a service that's made available generally and it's already been built and trained um, using data that's pre-aggregated by Microsoft. So all I do in Azure is I'll go ahead and I can really quickly show you this. I can go to cognitive services and add, go to the marketplace. And it's a face API. When I create this, okay. I'm basically just specifying a location to run it at. Um, logs into your brown account. But, but anyway, um, basically you're just specifying the location where you want your API service to run at. And um, you're, you're not doing any training. You're not loading any image resources or files. Um, you're, and you're selecting your pricing tier. Um, there is a FO pricing tier, so you can actually do quite a bit of interactions and, and testing with all of the cognitive services APIs before you even get to a tier where you're required to, to start paying a fee for processing the images. So um, I definitely encourage you to play around with any of the cognitive services APIs. Um, I, I want to say it's um, up to, I think, 20,000 predictions on the free tier. So it's, they give you quite a bit of room to, to play and learn about the services. So after you've created your API, you can go ahead and pull out for authentication your key here. Going through the API documentation, um, I, I didn't really think it would be helpful for me to, to get coordinates of, of the different items on the people's spaces. Um, so right now, I would just like to look at gender and to, I guess, to help provide kind of certainty about gender, I thought it would be cool to pull facial hair in there. It's going to be a general recognition model. And the picture that I'm going to use is the picture that we had seen previously with the, the 10 of us. So I'm just referencing the picture that's within my project here. My classification model is called crowd classification. Let's, there you go. I have it open up here. So I'm just pulling my endpoint out of my model here. And this is my, my API key. And I can go ahead and run this. And this is the JSON payload that it passes back. So we can go through and, and count the males. So I have one, two, three. Four, five, six, 
seven, eight males, and I have one, two females, and then I can do some some high level, you know, validation where the female has zero beard, mustache, and sideburns, and that kind of looks good to me. And here again, the second female has zero beard, zero mustache, zero sideburns. And it, I, I think it's quite interesting um, the the length of mustache and beard that I've I've seen in life in general over the last couple of years. So I'd I'd like to encourage you if somebody would like to do a trend analysis on um, the length of of people's beards and sideburns and see if you know, we're, we're getting longer or shorter, then I'd, I'd love to do a little kind of research article on that using cognitive services, because I, I think that that would be quite interesting. But again, as we look at the capabilities of the cognitive services APIs, we can see, you know, how this lets us perform these analyses using different media and much, much faster than we would ever be able to do it if we were um, programmatically writing code to perform this, this level of analysis. So it's, it's quite interesting how I see We'll be able to use AI moving forward. It's you know it's it's more for the, the classification of of data and getting that eighty percent of work done that our knowledge workers have previously been doing. You know either manually or you know just just in the most time consuming ways. So. With the explosion of data that that we have access to, I I see a lot of these types of activities being integrated with more of the traditional work that we've been doing as data practitioners. And I am the first one to say that I consider myself a, a traditional DBA. But um, being so close to, to the data, moving forward, where I see a lot more instances where we're going to be the ones that people come to to solution these applications or or these um, processes where we're able to to leverage these technologies and it's it's truly exciting so um thank you so much for letting me share um my excitement with you and share some of these services with you and I think that we we do have a little bit of time. So if we had any questions, I'd be more than happy to, to go over that with you.